This uh, section of Power and Market is nicely uh, broken into two parts. Uh, in the first part, uh, Rothbard gives us a uh, kind of a general uh, uh, treatment of uh, taxation. And then, <clears throat> then in the second part, he deals with the uh, question that obsesses the uh, mainstream, which is the incidence of taxation, uh, deal, dealing with the uh, whether or not uh, the person upon whom the tax is levied can shift the burden of the tax to someone else. <clears throat> so, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to divide this up. And um, <clears throat> since most of your questions uh, uh, that you wrote were about the first part of the material, um, let's go ahead and have some of our discussion uh, also about the uh, first part before we go on to uh, incidents. And uh, because of the sort of uh, broad uh, sense in which some of these questions uh, address uh, uh, issues, uh, it's helpful, I think, to just have them uh, addressed up front. <clears throat> now, one of the questions was, um, and this is a key question, of course, for studying, uh, for studying the, the, this whole week, uh, Rothbard's text. Um, what, what sort of contribution are the Austrians made here? What, what's the distinctiveness of the Austrians? Are they just sort of repeating in a better way uh, what the mainstream is doing, or, uh, or, or is there something uh, fundamentally uh, unique or distinctive about it? <clears throat> so let me uh, try to address this question by uh, asking you a question. Uh, how many of you have taken a course in public finance? A few of you, just just a few. How is the uh, how's the course laid out? What what's a, what's the sequence of topics that you you know just in general the broad topics that you take? Do you, do you dive right into taxes in a course in public finance? What's sort of the, what's the first thing you talk about? Yeah, and, what, and what's the purpose? Of talk, he said the social costs and benefits, or you, you talk a little bit about efficiency or some other thing like this, right? Why? Why do you talk about that first? What come, what, what, what's next after you talk about efficiency or uh, costs and benefits? Or What's the point? Why does the mainstream economist I thought this was about public finance, right? So why are you doing this? Where, where do they go with this? Yes. It ju just justify what? Okay. And what is their basic justification? Pick up one of these public finance books and you open it up the first few chapters and you, you uh, read through their uh, argument about the justification for government activity at all. Of course, you don't need taxes if you don't have any government activity, right? So first you justify government activity. How do they do it? How does a, a con mainstream economist justify it? National welfare. Yeah, it could be kind of a social wealth argument, right? The government can do certain things to raise our social well-being. And, and what are some of these? What, what would be a typical list that you would find? Or, or how could you say this in the negative? If the government can increase our social wealth, what's wrong with the market? It's failure. Market market is failing to uh, give us these uh, benefits that the state could uh, give us, and this justifies the state engaging in X, Y, and Z. And if the state, if we can show through some cost-benefit uh, analysis that the state should do X, uh, manage the national forests or something, then in that context we ask the question about taxation, right? We say, okay, the state has this job to do. Now, it has to be funded. The state's going to raise taxes to fund it. And so all the, all the analysis of taxation is done in that context, right? Now, how is this different already from what you know from reading uh, Power and Market? How, how is Rothbard's approach different here? <clears throat> By the way, is it different in the sort of sequence of topics? Logically, I'm talking about. Not, not as they're chronologically put in the book, but... Logically. Yes? In Rothbard's case, there isn't really market failure so that everyone exchanges their gain and mutual scheme. So you can't really start with the market failure. 
And uh, and why not? What, what I mean, does he just uh, say, in my opinion, there's no such thing as market failure, and so let's you know we can all be anarchists and uh, and here we go. Let's talk about taxation. Oh, uh, uh, when I, uh, I I teach public finance, and I use power and market. And when I teach public finance, I I, I set the uh, uh, topics out in the same way that a mainstream economist would. Uh, the students start by reading the last chapter of Power and Market, the one on public policy. And then we do the sixth chapter, the next to the last one, on anti, what's it called? Anti-market. Uh, right, right, right anti-market ethics. Uh, so, and of course this is a little bit broader than what the mainstream does, right? But this is, but it's the same, it's the same set of topics, right? In other words, first you ask the question, um, you know, sort of. Ha- we've already covered it. how does the market work, and does the market fail? Is there any function the government should do? And he answered these questions, right? So Rothbard gives his answer to those questions, and then, uh, and then he, since he takes the position that there isn't, he has to give a critique, right? So he has to critique all the claims that exist that government should be doing things, and then he gives us the analysis of taxation. Now, naturally, in that context, his analysis is going to be entirely different, right? It's entirely it, it, the sort of questions he asks, the, the the answers he gives, of course, are in the praxeological uh, uh, paradigm, and so we get somewhat different answers uh, w- with respect to that. But even the sort of approach he takes to the to the whole thing is different, right? There's a um, there's this hard and fast uh, discussion uh, Professor Block talked about, this hard and fast distinct, this praxeological distinction between voluntary and involuntary. We begin, right, with this and worry about, we've settled the other questions, right? And so we know that the state is engaged in these involuntary uh, activities and that this, this then is where we begin taxation, in, involuntary extraction of, of, uh, of uh, revenue. Uh, if you find that sort of a claim in a mainstream book, uh, they, they make nothing of it. No, no important implications come from this, right? that, that uh, taxation is uh, involuntary or extractive, coercive. They may say that, but uh, there's no analytical implication of it. So I would say this is the difference, right? We get, we get a, a complete praxeological development here. Um, uh, e- even on the question of the uh, activities of the state, what activities of the state can be justified? His analysis is uh, praxeological. Uh, this is a big difference. And so when he gets to taxation, it's all within the, the context of this uh, particular approach. <clears throat> okay, so given that, let's uh, continue on and some of the other things that he says in the introduction and some of the questions that you posed here. Uh, he points out, of course, in that the state has two sources of revenue. Uh, taxation, which is uh, praxeologically equivalent to robbery, it's an involuntary extraction, and uh, counterfeiting, right? monetary inflation. So, um, or fra- as he says, the issue of fraudulent money substitutes, or in the case of case he hasn't covered yet, of fiat uh, paper. Okay, so we have robbery and counterfeiting. Right? These are the sources of revenue for the state. And then he asks the next question. The next question in general analysis is. Uh, what's the burden on society when the, when, generally speaking, what's the burden on society when the state exercises uh, these, these revenue raising uh, activities? <clears throat> and he gives us a very interesting answer here. One, one again that I don't think you would find often in the mainstream. Uh, he says, there isn't any way to tell what the burden of uh, taxation is without including expenditures. And you remember the argument? Why does he say it? What's his reason here? You can't look at taxation alone, in other words. You have to look at both taxation and expenditure. And in fact, he says something, I believe he says something in the book, in the section like, uh, for the bulk of this uh, section, we'll consider that all tax revenues are spent by the state. Uh, in other words, what would happen if the government taxed us? Uh, uh, you know, we sent in our money to the IRS, and they didn't spend a dime of it. They just put it in the treasury vault. Then what would happen? Well, they burned it or something, right? Tossed it into the ocean, whatever. But but they didn't spend any of it. What would the effect be? 
the economic effect. Come on, you guys learned this already. <laughs> yes? Yeah. It, exactly. There would, be, there would be deflation, right? Monetary deflation. And we would get the non-neutral distribution effects of the monetary deflation. Okay? And there might be other income distribution effects if the government taxes us unequally, right? Disproportionately. So they take all the tax money from me or something. Well, that would So my, my uh, real position would fall. Uh, <clears throat> but... Uh, but there wouldn't be uh, there wouldn't be anything else, right? There wouldn't be an overall shifting of resources out of our hands and into the hands of the state. So this is why you must take the two together, right? The, the government isn't raising tax revenue to to put to bury the money in the ground or to burn it or throw it away. Uh, they want to spend it. They want the point is to shift resources into the hands of the state for their use uh, and away from uh, the private sector. So this is the general burden of taxation. It's the fact that these resources now are not available to us privately, but have been taken by the state to use for their own uh, purposes. So consumer satisfactions must, uh, we as consumers must have our satisfactions reduced. <clears throat> now he gets to the, the, the next step then. He says, um, uh, he says taxes then must divide society into two major groups. They're taxpayers on the one hand and tax consumers uh, on the other hand, and the tax consumers would include uh, would include not only uh, what you might think of as the ruling class, uh, you know, the politicians, the bureaucrats, uh, and so on, but those who are primarily subsidized by the state, you know, say uh, armament industry, or uh, uh, let's say if they're welfare recipients, right? They would be tax consumers, and so on. Now, one of you asked a question about this. Uh, uh, another uh, good, uh, good question that we need to uh, work out before we can uh, go on here. Uh, <clears throat> and this is, uh, well, isn't this distinction? Isn't it? Is this distinction really uh, operational? And I think the question, and whoever wrote the question, can, was it Mary? Okay, you can please speak up on my answer to it. But uh, so your question, your question that you pose is something like, well, isn't it sort of difficult to tell exactly who are in these groups uh, because the uh, effects of uh, the effects of what the state is doing are hard to disentangle. Their property, they're rearranging property ownership, and so on. And it's sort of difficult to tell exactly whether you're on net benefiting or being harmed by what the overall activity of the state. <clears throat> I, I think what Rothbard would say in response to this is that he's not really trying to ascertain the broader uh, the answer to the broader question: Is a person on net benefiting from the existence of the state or not? He's trying to answer a narrow question, which is: Is the revenue so the income earned by any particular person uh, from the, the taxation or not. On, on net, in other words, are, is the income that they're earning uh, uh, from taxation. And that question, I think, can be somewhat more easily answered. I, I agree that your, the question that you're trying to answer is much more difficult and, and probably entirely problematic. In other words, if we ask the question, you know, uh, how much do we benefit from the public roads or, you know, the uh, public subsidies of electricity or something relative to taxes that we pay and, and what have you. So, yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't know if you have to, to discuss part of this, this idea. Mm -hmm. uh, the, to, toward the, the issues that were implicitly uh, uh, called by this question, one of them is, uh, yeah, imagine, uh, imagine a guy that, I will take two examples to illustrate mm -hmm. them. Imagine a guy that uh, opened a restaurant in front of the Ministry of Education. Right. And uh, he clearly, to, uh, to, and all, I suppose all, that, all his clients are um, mm -hmm. public uh, civil servants. Right. And, uh, yeah, uh, so... <clears throat> Contrafactually, he will, he will have he will, he will have no business there. Probably at another place, we don't know. But mm -hmm. not there. then uh, imagine other. Uh, this is one example. The other one is imagine uh, categories of uh, 
people like uh, under 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 regulation, as we, we learned in the, in the mm -hmm. previous chapters, like uh, professors, pharmacians, and uh, and policemen. If you want, if you want to be to be to be a policeman, he has to, to be employed by the state. It's no, mm -hmm. it's no, it's mm -hmm. no other issue. So does not mean that you will not have that, that he's a direct. Uh, of course, he's a direct beneficiary of the of the social distribution, but it doesn't mean that you will not have. An opportunity on a free market, maybe at a higher price, maybe right. at a lower price, right. for, for, for formations and for, and for uh, lawyers and for other professions are regulated, is the same. And um, yeah, so uh, the importance to answer to this question, I think it's also from the perspective of, uh, of understanding the, the implication of, uh, of the distribution. And, uh -huh. uh, and probably finally, to to advocate the possibility of uh, restitution, to know to, to, to know from whom we took, to know from uh, to which we gave. If, right. If hypothetically we should uh, restitute the the, the past land Yeah. Okay. So so my response to this, I, I think again, is to say what I think Rothbard is aiming at in this distinction. What 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 implication does he think follows from this distinction? And uh, because I don't disagree with what you've uh, brought up, I think that you know this is uh, one way to look at it. But I think that you're by looking at it your way, you're addressing a different question. What Rothbard is trying to address is the it seems to me is the question of who makes up the ruling class, so to speak. How, how do we identify the class of rulers as opposed, you know, the ones who uh, uh, rule over us, the state apparatus itself? From those of us who are being ruled, and in in if that's your question, I think his distinction is sufficient. I take your distinction to mean something like, um, how do we, or what seems to be implied by your distinction is, how do we explain uh, those who are sort of uh, in favor of the state? How do we explain whether any particular person sort of says, I I like my government? Or at least I don't actively work against it. And there, I think what your the sort of broader sense in which you're trying to look at this would uh, would apply, right? So, so Rothbard really isn't trying to address that particular point of the, here. How, how would you answer the first question? Would you, would you be the answer to the first question? Who's the ruling class? Well, I think, uh, I don't think that Rothbard's distinction fully answers that question, but I think his distinction relates to the answer to that question. In other words, he's trying to just simply to say, who is monetarily uh, benefiting in terms of their uh, income, who's in a position to, to influence decision making in the state? Who, who, who are the monetary beneficiaries, the direct monetary beneficiaries of the state? Who would be in a position then to, to, you know, lobby the state to control the decision making process in the state? Now, the, now they're gray areas. I would admit they're gray areas between these, like maybe your case of the restaurateur. Uh, but uh, but he would not be included, right, in in Rothbard's category of a of a tax consumer. He he's just an entrepreneur who's who's uh, who has business clientele who happen to work for the state. He's not part of the state apparatus. He's unlikely that he's lobbying the state so that they you know these guys get bigger income so that he gets more of the of the money. And so on. And the guy that constructs high roads for the, the guy the guy that constructs high roads for the states, for example. Well, he would be higher. You, you mean just the the, the worker? The, no, the oh. entrepreneur is a private entrepreneur. That oh yeah, that he would be part of the apparatus, right? If he's working directly under contract of the state, he would be. And the distinction between the because he because he directly gets income from the state. He's in a position to be part of the decision-making process of the state. He's, he's, part, he's part of this apparatus of the state. He's part of the ruling class, then. But he's a private, he has, he has a private business. Yeah, well, he has a quasi-private business. <coughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So, but, but anyway, I think that's what he's trying to get. Okay, yes, go ahead. Pardon me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, here we have a, 
here we have a somewhat more complicated problem, right? It's like the uh, it's like the uh, state if the state monopolizes or subsidizes an industry where you've you've uh, specialized and your labor value exists there to the point where you can't find employment elsewhere, then then you're sort of stuck with this, right? I mean, it's not. I admit that they're gray cases and they're situations where we can't quite make this distinction black and white that uh, Rothbard's aiming at, but but I think that's what he would say in response to that particular problem. Okay, well, uh, let's go on to the next thing. So uh, Rothbard says taxes then divide society into these two big groups uh, as far as the uh, this uh, narrow question that he's trying to uh, address. <clears throat> and then he says uh, the, on the expenditure side, the basic point about expenditure, of course, is that the expenditure redistributes income. So he gives a simple example of taxing the codfish industry and then the state spends the money on armaments. And he just quickly uh, rehearses what would happen to factor prices and incomes and entrepreneurial profits, right? We, this story we know fairly well. The um, uh, uh, prices of the speci uh, specific factors in uh, codfish industry would, would fall dramatically. The non-specific would fall less. And those guys would exit and go to uh, less uh, high-paying uh, opportunities. Uh, the marginal producers would exit the market. Uh, supplies would be reduced, prices would rise. Uh, in armaments, there would be uh, uh, you know higher income, higher prices, higher incomes, greater profitability to the production of specific factors, and so on. <clears throat> uh, third thing he points out uh, in the general uh, part is that uh, taxing and, and expenditures of the state are in fact compatible with equilibrium. Once the state puts in to pro, you know, into motion a, a system of uh, taxing and uh, spending, then uh, entrepreneurs will adjust to this, factor reallocations will occur, and uh, a new equilibrium, a new final state of rest would be reached. And this could, could in fact then be a, uh, um, a, a stable, ongoing equilibrium situation. Now, he wants to say this because he wants to uh, contrast this situation with inflation. So if the state uses its second form of raising revenue, monetary inflation, especially through credit expansion, this activity that they set in motion, the economic repercussions of this, uh, uh, do not lead to equilibrium. Right? This activity leads to the boom bust. There, there is no permanent new final state of rest that can be reached if the state uh, finances its expenditures through monetary inflation and credit expansion. So that, that's an important distinction between these two uh, methods of um, uh, finance. Uh, then he gets to the next point in the general overview, which is uh, again one that uh, questions were asked about, and this is that uh, he says uh, all government expenditures for resources are uh, consumption. In other words, they cannot be considered investment <coughs> uh, or uh, producing capital goods. They're only they're only consumption. And he says this is true just as a matter of uh, category, de of definitions, right? What is a consumer good? A consumer good is a good that directly satisfies uh, a, a the end. And when a government official decides uh, or a group of them decide uh, we'll spend on the, this particular uh, good, it directly satisfies their preference. Now, one of you asked a question about this. You said, well, what, but, isn't, but isn't the distinction between a... Uh, Capital good and a consumer good also related to time. So wouldn't it be, in other words, uh, there might be some future end that's being achieved by a government production. So, so wouldn't, couldn't that be considered a capital good? And I think the example was like a dam. So the government builds a Hoover Dam or whatever. And then wouldn't it be, <clears throat> wouldn't that be a capital good because it gives a consumption value to politicians in the future? But I, I don't think that's right. I think it would just be a durable consumer good, would it? Would it not? It would just be a durable consumer good, right? It's just it's just con continuously giving. If it does, it would continuously give consum direct consumption services to politicians. In other words, they're not using it to produce something else. They're not. It's not integrated in, uh, into the capital structure. It's just uh, it's just a direct consumption good for them. Now, there's another question that Rothbard doesn't address, which uh, I think we might uh, usefully explore. Maybe, maybe it's true. Maybe he's right about that. Let's set, set that question aside uh, as to the uh, nature, the consumptive nature of the good from the viewpoint of government officials. 
Could we say that the dam or the road or whatever it is that the state uh, produces is a capital good uh, for the economy, for entrepreneurs in the economy? Could the, is the dam a capital good in this respect? <clears throat> or the road or, again, whatever you know, infrastructure or whatever uh, uh, durable goods are produced by the state? And I think here the answer that Rothbard would give, I'm not sure he addresses this question in the text, but I think the answer he would give here is no, it's not. It's not a capital good. And the reason that uh, I would say this, is, or a couple of reasons, actually, I would say this. First of all, one way to look at this would be in the following. Uh, the good that's produced, the, the, the dam, the road, uh, whatever it might be, um, isn't integrated into the uh, uh, entrepreneur's assessment of economic calculation of the different stages of production and capital capital goods, right? Uh, the road is a free good. Now, how, would an on, how should an entrepreneur treat a free good? It's free to him. Right? Free to him with respect to his business calculation. It's free. Well, he treats it just like, a, like it were an existing, a pre-existing fact of uh, nature. Like, like it were a grove of trees or a, right? something that just exists in nature. That's not a capital good. That, that isn't definitionally a capital good. Um, and let me, let me give you an example to, to, if this sounds maybe not quite right to you, let me give you an example to illustrate this. Uh, Mark uh, Thornton mentioned in his discussion uh, the railroads. <clears throat> okay, so we know, we know the story of the railroads, right? So we have these uh, huge uh, subsidies, land grants, and uh, loan guarantees and so on to the uh, railroad companies. Uh, that uh, fostered all this uh, building of the transcontinentals, and uh, and we uh, we agree, right, uh, that this is all malinvestment, or a large portion of this is malinvestment. In fact, later on, many of these railroads do in fact go bankrupt. But what do we say about the? What then do we say about the entrepreneurs who built their businesses along the railroad? What about them? What, isn't this inefficient too? Wasn't there an over buildup, right? A, a malinvestment. A, too much capital was being directed here because they were getting essentially a free, well, not a free, but a subsidized, uh, a subsidized good. This isn't fully, right? This creates some uh, malinvestment. So it seems to me the same thing would be true about a road. You put in a road, right? Government puts in a nice new road. Entrepreneurs, it's a free good to them. They come and they build along the road. They buy their, right? They get their uh, uh, businesses set up along, along the road. And this, well... This is malinvestment. Then, this is a distortion in the in the same uh, in the same way. Uh, so, so those are the reasons uh, that I, I would uh, suggest. Again, the uh, the good that the state produces is not produced under economic calculation, and therefore, even if we treat it, even if we say somehow categorically it's a capital good, there there would be a distortion involved. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, uh, the next thing is um, that Rothbard gets is the uh, last couple of things here is uh, he says, uh, okay, so uh, in general, then there's a twofold effect of taxation. The first is that it distorts the allocation of resources. Consumers uh, under uh, some taxing uh, uh, scheme then have their preferences satisfied less fully as possible. Uh, this is his idea that no tax is neutral to the market. Right? Every tax um, affects, uh, just like uh, every uh, monetary inflation, uh, affects the pattern of prices, uh, income distribution, production patterns uh, in the economy. He says there are only three things that are neutral to the market. These are voluntary purchases uh, that lead to prices and so on. Uh, second would be uh, voluntary contributions, gifts, voluntary transfers. These are neutral to the market. And the third uh, would be restitution payments that are made by criminals. These are neutral. And aside from this, nothing else is neutral. Everything else uh, distorts the allocation of resources. Now, uh, one of you asked a question about uh, the relationship between Mises' views and Rothbard's views on the question of tax neutrality. Um, uh, so let me try to address this. Um, 
most of you know uh, Mises is a, well, a minarchist, right? He's a minimal government uh, advocate. So he advocates the minimal state uh, uh, necessary just to defend person and property from uh, criminal uh, aggression and nothing else. <clears throat> and so this does raise the question of, well, okay, you have to have taxes. So Mises was in favor of the necessary taxes to do this. Um, did he think that the uh, taxes that would be raised for the state uh, in the minimal uh, condition uh, could be raised uh, in a neutral fashion? Did he, did he think that uh, you know, raising the amount of money would uh, be, could, could, in fact, be neutral to the market? Now, the best of my knowledge, and help me out uh, as to the faculty if I uh, just am ignorant of this, he, he didn't write on this particular question. I, I don't think he ever, at least in human action, I'm pretty sure he didn't say anything about this, whether or not they would distort the market. Um, his I take his position by inference to be that they would distort the market. Now, there's not, in his section on taxation, he, he certainly uh, doesn't give any indication that there's something like a neutral tax. So, and of course, Mises was interested in other lines of argument from Rothbard. He wasn't really interested in this question of neutral taxation, but in his other theories of taxation, like... Uh, like the uh, uh, sort of snowballing effect of intervention and so on. But, uh, but I think that Mises would say, uh, whatever distorting effect that the taxes create that are necessary to fund the minimal state, you, you just have to bear them. You have to bear them because they're the price you pay, part of the price you pay to have the defense services of the state. Uh, so I... I, I don't know of any, you know, drawn out debate between uh, the two positions. It does lean for neutral, but it does distinguish between confiscatory taxation, which does, uh, yeah. in principle, um, the, the destructive of the market, mm -hmm. and then taxation necessary to fund. Yeah, right, right. You're, you're absolutely right. He doesn't, he doesn't say. No, I mean the term neutral. Yeah. So. He doesn't say about that. Yeah. And, and I'm pretty sure his position would be that if if he thought that the taxes necessary to fund the minimal state did disrupt the market. Well, well so so be it, right? You, because you had to you had to have the state uh, performing these functions. So on that on that point, I don't I don't think they really had any give and take, or the was much uh, discussion between them on that. Uh, okay, so that's the first effect of taxation, right? It distorts the allocation of resources. And then the second is that it severs uh, income uh, well, distribution, so to speak, from production. All right, so Rothbard makes the point, uh, again, this is a, uh, directly from his praxeological view, uh, that there is no income distribution in the market. There's just the production and earning of income. There's no separate distribution process. People simply produce income, and then they earn it. And what the state does through taxing and spending, of course, is uh, sever this link. So, they, so the state actually creates the problem of income distribution, since there is no income distribution, per se, uh, on the market. <clears throat> uh, then finally, the last uh, point that he makes, uh, again, that you won't find, in the, I don't think, in the standard treatment, is he says, um, he says the, the extent, or you won't find any emphasis on this in the standard treatment, he says, the extent of the distortion that's created by taxation and expenditure of the state depends on depends primarily upon the level of taxation and expenditure and not upon the form of taxation and expenditure. So that, that's just a secondary question. The, the big question is, does the state take 50% of our income or does it take 20% or does it take 5%? Not, does the state have uh, uh, excise taxes or does it have tariffs or does it raise its taxes through income taxes and so on? Now, it's not to say that those questions are un totally unrelated. Uh, it's just that uh, uh, Rothbard's emphasis then is on, of course, reducing this distortion. You want to reduce the distortion, it's better to reduce overall taxes than it is to, say, shift from the, I don't know, uh, income tax to, uh, to a value-added tax or something of the sort. Now, let me get to one last question that was uh, asked in this introductory part. And I think this was asked by uh, by uh, Jonas, so I'll ask him to uh, comment on this because I don't because it, w it wasn't elaborated on. 
But I, I think uh, the question went something like this. Okay, uh, I don't really, I can't go along with Rothbard really here on this, all this taxing stuff or anarchy or whatever underlies it. Um, and uh, the reason is because I think Rothbard has a incorrect or stunted um, notion of human nature. But there was no elaboration, so maybe you can say exactly what, uh, what you have in mind here. It's more of a justification for driving violence so much. I think it goes back again to my question of the dinosaur case. Because I think that if you, <clears throat> if you decide that there's no comparison, then by definition, all taxation, all the distribution is by definition bad or it will increase you to it. However, if you do not take that standpoint, then other you have to take a, you have to approach the theory from a different angle, and sort of from there, I, I find that this discussions on taxation and such like doesn't conform with my view because I still I am not convinced or I can't see the logic of not comparing. Ah, uh, okay. Some values. So right. from there, I mean, I, I, these, these conclusions follow logically. It's just that, to me, mm -hmm. they, they don't mm -hmm. feel relevant because I have another view on this issue, to a certain extent. Okay. But w w would, you go, would you say, though, that, it, that the analysis that he does after this introductory section where he goes through the incidence of taxation, he kind of lays out the economic implications of each of these different types of taxes, you wouldn't then say that all of that is incorrect, right? Uh, you just definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah. Okay. But we just that he uses. I think he relies on the basic notion that all forms of distribution are, per definition, uh, a mislocation of resources or something else. And I think well, from, from from that point of view, and I think it stems from this <laughs> conviction that you cannot compare the personal values or into the other. And I agree to some part, I don't agree all, and therefore his conclusions to me they don't. So uh, I really didn't want to elaborate on this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to the mm -hmm. point. That was just justification for, for why I didn't submit right. any, any questions on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, it would be great if I could, if, well, if I could be convinced of the argument that I've been thus far. It has been sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. not avoided, but and, and to me it's the crucial part of it because for, for me this is where it becomes political because I think this is the, the you know the, the crucial point where everything evolves around. And as long as that is not resolved, I can't agree with this conclusion. Right. Okay. Let me let me take one stab at that. Um, the way that I think about the relationship between those two elements, the utilities analysis and the sort of, this sort of, uh, economic effects that we trace out through the economy, that, that I don't think, the way I see it, the distinction that Rothbard makes is that in the market, all these changes are, are voluntary. And with the state, they're involuntary. And so that distinction is sufficient. It isn't that we, it isn't that any inter, interpersonal comparisons need to be made in order to get to the latter part of the analysis. We just have to have that distinction. And I think that is a very valid distinction to the extent. Uh, on the other hand, I think that, uh, I think it's just that I think it's a question of what you want to maximize. What is it that we strive for? And I think I am more bound to have a more Coming from Sweden, <laughs> I think they tend too much. I think they tend more to, to think in terms of society. For me, it's an actual term. And I think maybe increase utility for me. And I mean, from that point of view, where there are voluntary transactions, I definitely agree. It's just that I, I think that the, uh, the involuntary actions can upset. I think it's a handsome thing. How much? But it's. This is just, I, I had no intention of elaborating on it. Okay, well, well maybe, maybe something we say will trigger further thoughts on that.
Okay, so uh, anything else that you want to take take up at this point uh, in this introductory section? All right, let, let's go to the second uh, half of this then and uh, talk about his uh, incidence uh, theory. <clears throat> and here too we find that uh, uh, Rothbard's treatment is somewhat different than the mainstream. Um, so he begins this discussion just by uh, introducing the idea of incidence and says, okay, the question at hand is whether a tax can be shifted if a tax is placed upon, uh, let's say, a seller of a good on an entrepreneur. You tax uh, Apple computers. Um, it, can this tax just be uh, 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 sent along the uh, by, by raising, let's say, selling prices sent along to the consumer? Can it just be passed on to the consumer, <clears throat> or or can it be passed backward by lowering factor prices? So this is a question of incidence, or does the tax have to be borne by the person upon whom the tax is levied? This is the question. And he says the basic law of incidence is that no tax can be shifted forward. In no circumstances can any tax be shifted forward. Now, uh, his argument is uh, uh, straightforward here, although, again, it depends upon uh, the absorption of his uh, economic theory. And the argument is this, that uh, the, uh, the prices that... Uh, exist in markets for goods that the consumers are paying are set by the consumer's demands. And the seller has already set the price at the point where he thinks he's getting the greatest revenue. He's already set it at the point where he thinks he's, you know, his monetary situation is as good as it can be. So when the tax is levied on him, it would uh, simply hurt him even more if he tries to raise his price. If he raises his price, then his revenues will fall. This is what he what he, the position that he's in, right? The tax on the seller does nothing to change the demand that the buyer has for the good. The demand the buyer has for the goods based upon the marginal utility places on the good. He doesn't even know what the, you know, what tax, taxes the seller is paying. He doesn't know what his production costs are. He doesn't care about any of this. And so no tax could ever be passed forward because these prices, uh, depend upon, uh, the buyer's demands. And the buyer's demands cannot be influenced by the seller's costs or taxes or uh, other aspects. Okay, that's the uh, basic law of uh, incidence. Then he says, uh, then he gets to uh, topology of taxes, and he says there are two types of taxes. There are, first of all, taxes on income. Okay, these taxes that we pay out of our uh, uh, earnings uh, uh, from production. And these he uh, subdivides uh, into the general categories are uh, a general income tax and a partial income tax. So a general income tax would be an income tax at the same rate on all sources of income. A partial income tax obviously then on just some uh, uh, forms of income, like a tax on just wages or a tax just on corporate profits. And then the third category is a general sales tax. Uh, tax uh, at the same rate on all sales of everything, and then uh, a, a partial sales tax. So those are the income taxes. And then he says the second type, the second broad type of taxes are taxes on accumulated capital. So this is a wealth tax, right? A tax on on the uh, accumulation of wealth that people have engaged in uh, in the past. And here he gives us the following uh, types. He says they're tax on gifts or bequests. They're taxes on property, on the value of your, uh, uh, the capital value of your property, the accumulated value of your property, and taxes on personal wealth. So these are the three categories. So now let's work through uh, each of these uh, briefly and uh, see if this stimulates uh, some, some additional questions. And again, when we open up for the a final uh, round of questions. You can we can come back to the material at the beginning if you'd like. Okay, so let's start with the general sales tax. We'll just take these in the same order that he offers them. <clears throat> the general sales tax. Let's say it's a 20% uh, tax uh, that would, is on all sale. All, so all sellers are the tax is levied upon them, no matter what they're selling, as a 20% uh, tax uh, on the value of what they sell. Uh, as Rothbard points out, this uh, it can't be shifted forward. 
uh, buyer's demands are already uh, are set, uh, whatever they happen to be, and the sellers all have already uh, set their prices with respect to those demands at the best possible point, and so uh, it would only be harmful to raise them. Uh, so what the tax, what the general sales tax does, of course, is lower the net uh, income of the uh, or net uh, revenues of the uh, entrepreneur. It lowers his proceeds, right? His uh, monetary uh, sum of money that he has to demand the factors of production. Uh, for all entrepreneurs throughout the whole economy. And so naturally, if they have less money to uh, bid for the factors of production, all the factor prices must fall. So this tax, so a general sales tax, as he points out, is just an income tax. It's a tax that's shifted backwards onto producers and it lowers their incomes. It isn't, uh, 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 it isn't really a tax on consumption, uh, 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 a tax on uh, consumption uh, itself. It, it's imputed back and becomes a, an income tax. <clears throat> uh, so, so this is the, the first step. Uh, in the second step, he says, uh, again, to have a full analysis, we have to include the expenditures. What would happen then with the expenditures? Okay, he's explained this in the general section before, but uh, the expenditures uh, of the state then would add an a, a, a income redistribution and a change in the pattern of production. So the state spends on armaments, right? so entrepreneurs would respond to this, building up, uh, uh, because it's more profitable now to produce, they would have more income, bidding factors away from other processes, and wages of those workers would rise, and specific factor prices would rise. Uh, they're necessary to produce here. Uh, more entrepreneurs would move into this field and out of others. right? So we get this, this pattern of uh, change of the resource allocation and incomes along this, along this uh, lines of spending of the state. And then he addresses this last, uh, uh, the last question he addresses is, uh, uh, does, uh, on the general sales tax, uh, uh, this, the general sales tax, he says, does not favor saving and investing. Right? It isn't that you, you tax consumption, right? And so people shift away from consumption towards saving and investing. Why not? Well, uh, as we said bef before, what happens to the general sales tax is not that prices rot, prices don't rise, right? So, so demands don't change it with, in that respect. Uh, incomes are reduced. And when incomes are reduced, if time preferences don't change, he'll get to that question later, but at this point he's just assuming time preferences don't change, then with their lower incomes, people will in fact distribute uh, their incomes to consumption and saving in the same proportion. And so saving isn't favored by this. Uh, and he gives us this example just to illustrate a useful uh, algebraic uh, example where uh, we have uh, net income of uh, people uh, is their gross income minus the tax and their consumption is 90% of their net income. So we have fixed time preferences, right? 10% is being saved, 90% consumed. And we have two cases, an income tax, which is 20% of gross income and a tax on consumption, which is 20% of consumption. And so he gives us a numeric example to work through. Our gross income is 100. With the income tax, we get this sequence, right? Uh, we just work out the simple algebra here. So net income with the tax becomes 80% of gross income. So with gross income at 100, net income is 80. 90% of that gives us consumption. That's 72. 8% is saved, right? <clears throat> and then here uh, in the second column is the uh, uh, tax on consumption. So we have net income equal to gross income minus the consumption tax. We plug in, do the algebra, right? Substitute for consumption what we know it's equal to with respect to net income, solve the equation, and we find that net income is gross over uh, uh, 1.18. So then we solve this when gross income is 100. We see that net income is 85, and then 90% of that roughly 76, and 10% uh, 9. Right? So the whole, so so uh, all of us, uh, in the face of a general sales tax, all of us work out the uh, you know best uh, arrangement, the best new arrangement of a, when our income is being reduced. Uh, also considering our time preference, right? and our time preference, if it doesn't change, would still dictate the same proportion between saving uh, and uh, consumption. And so saving is not uh, proportionately aided. Uh, by a consumption tax.
Or as he puts it somewhere else in the chapter, he says, there's no such thing as a consumption tax. If you try to tax a general consumption tax, if you try to tax consumption, it's just an income tax. Okay, now what about a partial uh, sales tax? Uh, here, Rockwell points out there, there would be additional effects, right? Because what would happen in the, in the case of just taxing uh, one particular line of good, you just tax uh, Apple products, iPods, iPhones, and so on, you would get uh, uh, shifting effects. Right? Now you can, you can uh, producers and so on would begin to shift away uh, from, uh, from these tax goods into untaxed. So uh, let's say if uh, Steve Jobs tried to lower the incomes of his workers in the face of the tax, right? He can't, again, pass it on to his consumers, but he tries to lower his wage payments, then his non-specific factors will lead because they can get the market wage in, in the untaxed sector of the economy. So they'll just, they'll bolt, at least on the margin, they'll leave, right? Uh, and uh, 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 so, th so we, we would get this effect, the shifting out effect, right? And uh, the specific factors, that uh, the f full burden of the reduction of income would fall upon the specific factors. The specific capital that's been invested, the name brand of Apple, whatever capital assets they possess, the income value, the capital value, of those things would then uh, decline. This means there would be less invested in these areas since the capital value of these particular assets are less. Capital investment would move to other lines of production and uh, and we get a further distortion, a big, uh, you know, a, an additional uh, economic effect that would not occur under the general sales tax. <clears throat> okay, now uh, let's uh, move to the general income tax. Um, uh, and so here, uh, Rothbard goes through the additional, uh, you know, the effects unique to a general income tax that, that he, he uh, didn't address in talking about the general sales tax. So remember, a general uh, income tax would be on all sources of income, wages, um, uh, ground rents, interest, profit. Again, this can't be shifted forward or backward. The producer would have to uh, bear the reduction of income. Uh, when this happens, then, of course, standards of living of the, of the uh, producer's uh, declines. Uh, they would adjust to this in the following fashions, uh, potentially at least. Uh, they might decrease work and increase their leisure in the face of this, right? At the margin, some people would be doing this. So uh, here we would get a further than uh, a depressing effect on people's standards of living and production. Uh, it says, secondly, they might uh, substitute uh, work in kind for work uh, uh, to earn money, to earn income. They might uh, start doing things themselves. Uh, they work on their own automobiles. They uh, clean their own houses. They... Uh, do their own uh, gardening or lawn uh, uh, maintenance and so on. As he points out, this this then disrupts the division of labor. This makes us less uh, well off since the division of labor becomes eliminated by our taking on these tasks. We're not fully taking advantage of the division of labor as we were before. And so standards of living again uh, decline because of this. And then uh, additionally, he says, uh, when the, ta when the uh, general income tax reduces our, our incomes and our monetary assets in the present, uh, our time preferences would rise. Our time preference rates would go up. Uh, when our time preference rates go up, uh, we would save and invest less. Less would be put into the capital accumulation process, and the whole capital structure would, in the future would be uh, less, uh, less productive uh, and innovative and uh, so on. Now, he points out that this uh, increase in time preference would not be offset when the, when the uh, income is transferred to government officials who then spend it since, of course, in his view, uh, their expenditures are all consumption. Uh, if the income is transferred to other groups from one group to another, okay, so you're not, you wouldn't be completely sure of the overall net effect on uh, time preference. But again, as long as government officials are taking a take out of this, they're taking their cut, right, to, out of the out of the transfer funds, then his position would be, since their expenditures are all consumption, this would uh, lower overall time preferences, lower the amount of saving and investing, and have this effect on uh, the capital structure. Okay, then partial income taxes, uh, he runs through the, the following uh, list. He says, uh, uh, first there could be taxes on wages. Uh, taxes on wages cannot be shifted. Uh, the in uh, worker has to bear them. 
This is true of all, all levies on, uh, on uh, uh, labor, right? Uh, something that isn't uh, well understood by, uh, uh, by the general public. That uh, you know, their Social Security taxes aren't really half paid by the, their employer. They're fully paid, but paid by the worker. Right? It doesn't matter whether the uh, employer is uh, nominally sending the money in. Uh, their, their overall compensation is lowered by that amount. Uh, same, same of uh, mandatory health benefits, right? They're not getting any benefit from this. They're, they're just trading off monetary income for the payment uh, for health care. So if, you're, if your employer is paying all of your health care expenses, he's lowered your uh, uh, wage uh, income commensurately. Uh, otherwise, there would, again, be a discharge of workers from this activity. Uh, the corporate income tax can't be shifted. It has to be borne by, uh, by the corporation, by the owners of the corporation. Uh, this tax, as Rothbard points out, uh, penalizes the corporate form, and therefore, since it lowers the uh, you know return to uh, investment in the corporate form, investment then would shift out into less efficient at the margin, less efficient uh, uh, business forms, and uh, and the overall uh, rate of return throughout the economy would then fall, right? And so the so the effect of this is to generally suppress. Uh, the rate of return, and to then therefore uh, a reduced saving and investing overall. He points out that the corporate income tax, as it's typically levied, is a double taxation. Uh, first, the corporation's uh, profits are taxed, and then when the remaining uh, amount is distributed to the uh, shareholders, that would then be taxed again as, uh, as uh, income. Uh, the only way, he points out, to eliminate this is to, uh, is to treat... Uh, uh, corporate uh, income as a pro rata net income to the shareholders. So, uh, so you, under those conditions, you could eliminate, you'd have to eliminate the corporate income tax that way, but then you would just tax regular uh, income. Uh, as he points out, this uh, double taxation then favors uh, retained earnings, and it leads to an inefficient amount of uh, reinvestment in firms, in, in corporations. Uh, the excess profit tax, he points out, um, uh, interferes with the uh, most important reallocation process of entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are earning more profit, the more urgent the reallocation uh, to satisfy uh, consumer preferences is. And therefore, this is particularly harmful to the whole process of uh, uh, readjusting, uh, reallocating uh, factors of production. Uh, the capital gains tax, as he points out, capital gains are, in fact, income. And so they could be treated, this could be treated also as an income tax. So uh, it's a public company, uh, there's shares of stock. And so if the corporation uh, earns profit and retains the earnings, the stock prices rise. Uh, the uh, capital gain uh, uh, that depreciates to the shareholder is income. Um, as he points out, this, uh, um, uh, this, this, uh, g there's one situation under which this, this gain would not be income. And that would be if the uh, taxation of uh, capital gains is not on a, a, a cruel basis, but on a realized basis, like it is in our system. Then the capital gains tax becomes a tax on accumulated capital. So in other words, if you don't pay the uh, capital gains tax until you sell and realize the capital gain from your investment, then the capital gains tax is a tax on accumulated capital and not an income tax. And this would, in fact, uh, make a difference. Uh, then uh, the other point that he makes about this is that um, uh, there's one, there would be one difference between taxing corporate income, taxing uh, profit uh, or corporate income, and uh, taxing uh, capital gains. And this is that uh, capital gains would, uh, would include also speculation of the anticipation of earning profit in the future. Whereas the actual profit of the corporation then would not include that. So, so there is a, uh, that difference between those two forms. Uh, and then he points out that there are certain difficulties, of course, involved in capital gains taxes. If you want uniformity of the rate, this would be appraisal of the value of assets if they're not often sold, adjustments for changes in the PPM, and so on. Okay, then, then he uh, goes on to taxes on accumulated capital. This section is somewhat uh, shorter. He points out the main difference here, this is an important uh, distinction, the main difference here is that when you tax accumulated capital, you actually tax then the, uh, the uh, capital structure itself. And so you, you begin to give uh, this uh, disincentive 
to the maintenance and uh, uh, restoration of the capital structure itself. Whereas when you're taxing income, you're just taxing the ability people have to accumulate additional capital. Right? But if you tax their, tax their capital, then you're actually destroying or uh, forcing them to consume capital. So this is much worse. Taxing accumulated capital is, is worse for the economy or for our satisfaction of our preferences than taxing income. Uh, other things the same. Now, as far as gratuitous uh, transfers as a form of this, um, he points out that uh, inheritance taxes are particularly bad. This is because uh, uh, all, all, uh, every asset uh, eventually has to be taxed under this uh, system. And so everything is eventually taxed. This destroys the ability of families to, or impinges upon the ability of families to accumulate capital. Uh, it has uh, uh, detrimental effects on charitable activity, on intergenerational family relationships, and so on. Uh, then he gets to the property tax. This, he, he says, uh, the property tax is levied on property itself and not on the person who owns the property. That would then be a personal wealth tax. With a property tax, there are two types, partial and uh, general. Uh, the key thing about a partial property tax is that the partial property tax would be would lead to tax capitalization. And tax capital, he gives an example of this as well. We'll just quickly run through his simple algebraic example here. Uh, but the basic idea is that if you if you just tax, let's say, a particular parcel of land or just some group of land, let's say uh, you tax land that's growing soybeans, <coughs> Uh, then what would happen, of course, is that investors who uh, you know, are uh, assessing the value of investing in the land that's producing soybeans <coughs> would, uh, would uh, reduce their uh, bids for the land that, uh, that produces the soybeans. And that's, that's what he means by capitalization, right? The tax would actually affect the capital value of the asset being taxed. And uh, it would do so to the extent that the rate of return that's earned in the economy uh, uh, on that, on the soybeans, and the rest of the economy would be uh, uh, equalized again, just as it was before the tax was levied. And so here's the simple case that he gives. Let's say we have a parcel of land has a capital value of 10000 The interest rate is 5%, so it's uh, generating a, a, a rental value of 500 every period. So in this simple example, right, we just take the interest rate, multiply by the capital value, and we get the uh, we get the rent. This is a perpetuity. It's generating this rent forever into the future. So the simple formula is adequate to cover the case. So let's say the state comes along, assesses a tax of one uh, percent of the capital value. Now the relationship changes, right? Algebraically, we would have the interest rate multiplied by the capital value is the net return, the gross return minus the tax. So that gives us this. We can solve that algebraic uh, formula, and we come down here. If uh, right, we uh, solve for the capital value in terms of the rate of return, the interest rate, and the uh, tax rate. So, if it's generating the same rent of $500, the capital value now is reduced to $8,333.33. The tax would be uh, 1% of that. The uh, return then would be the $500. The rent would be the $500 minus the tax. So the net rent is 41667. That net rent is a uh, percent of the capital, the lower capital value is the 5%. Right? So he's just running through a quick illustration of how this would, you know, what the outcome of this would be. But the logic is, uh, is just uh, based upon the, uh, the economics we've uh, gone through before. Now he points out there's certain implications of this, right? Uh, uh, current, current holders of land would be, would be affected, they would be the ones who fill the burden of this tax, right? When the, uh, taxes levied, the value of their land would drop. So they suffer the full burden of this. Others who come in later and invest in the land would not, right? They get the same rate of return as they would anywhere in the economy. By the way, this, this also works in reverse for subsidies. If you have land subsidies, then the person who owns the land at the beginning, well, that person gets the full, the full benefit forever into the future, right? The full anticipated benefit of that subsidy. Anybody who invests later on doesn't. This is why uh, farm subsidies, for example, don't do farmers any good. They, they don't actually benefit them over the long run. Right? They give them a one-time capital gain, but then uh, their operation is just the same as it was before. Uh, same here. Right? A one-time uh, loss, then the operation is restored 
its economic calculation is restored. Now, of course, it, it, the allocation isn't exactly the same, right? If, you, if the government is taxing soybean production, you know, land just producing soybeans, then, of course, there'll be exodus from that production process, right? So in the interim, what Rothbard's not showing in this example is that farmers would, some of them would take their land out of soybeans, shift into corn, and so on. And, uh, so we get, again, a, a misallocation and a less uh, uh, full uh, satisfaction of consumer preferences. Uh, then then uh, uh, let me point out then the general property tax, of course, would not be capitalized, right? Because there's nowhere to shift, right? There's no, uh, well, Rothbard, Rothbard's assuming that we just, we're just looking at a domestic economy. If, if the United States government were the only uh, government that levied a general <coughs> property tax, then we'd have exodus to foreign countries. And we would have some re equal, we, did, we would have some capitalization of that. But if we just had one tax again on all uh, property everywhere at the same rate, then there wouldn't be anywhere to move, right? And so the rate of return would have to be reduced, and saving and investing would be reduced commensurate with this. And then finally, he uh, mentions the personal wealth wealth tax. This this is a tax on on the person that has to be paid out of his wealth. And uh, as he points out, this could be uh, this would uh, have the general effect that he mentioned before of uh, if the person has to pay out of his accumulated wealth in order to uh, meet the tax uh, burden, then this would actually begin to destroy the capital structure. He's consuming his capital now. The value of his capital is actually falling. 